now going to learn about something called a one sample T. And what's fun about this is that we're going to learn a little bit about how beer and statistics are related. And I'm going to use this example with beer to explain why the one sample Z won't work for most instances of statistics. So this is where we're going to tell a little story. I'm going to talk to you about Gossett. Gossett worked for Guinness. He was the head brewer of Guinness. And it was right around the time of the World War One, oh, World War II, sorry. Um, and Gossett was um, employed by Guinness to really maximize their production of beer. And um, Guinness was kind of a, a forward thinking beer company and they hired him to figure out how to deal with the fact that their crops were coming in at a different rate than it had been in the past. And so they wanted to see how they could test quality of the crops um, for beer without sacrificing um, all of the, the product just to be testing. So that was Gossett's job. And so I'm gonna simplify a little bit of what he did to make sure that we understand, but I'll explain why Gossett and beer are related to statistics. To statistics. So let's just say that Gossett was using um, our typical normal distribution with a rejection region of 1.96 and higher or negative 1.96 and lower. And let's just say that he was testing the quality of the hops used to make beer. And now these aren't the true numbers that he would be using, but I want to align this with something that you're familiar with. So let's just say that while he's um, sampling the hops to see their quality, that if he finds something to be on the upper tail of the distribution, do you see how he would reject the null and say, this batch of hops is not like normal. There's something wrong with it. It's too high in whatever quality we're looking at. Maybe we could just say, um, I don't know anything about hops, but let's just say acidity. Like, so this would be too high in acidity, and this would be too low in acidity. And then in this white region here would be that the hops are, are normal. And so what Gossett's job was to do was to test the um, product and see how it was. And if anything was too high or too low, then he'd stop the production and they would have to figure out uh, what's happening, why are the crops bad, that kind of thing. Because Guinness did not want to put out bad beer. So hopefully you understand kind of Gossett's role is that he was testing the batches and seeing how they came out. And if a batch came out too high, he'd say, stop everything. We gotta figure out what's wrong with this crop. Or if it came out too low, he'd say, stop everything. Let's figure out what's wrong with this crop. But anything in between those two markers, he would deem as okay. Now, um, Guinness actually had a much smaller range of normality because they didn't want to have there to be such variability. But again, I'm trying to align this with more of what we're familiar with. Okay, so let's say that the batches of hops that Gossett was looking at were normal. They were all of fine um, acidity. You could see how 5% of the time he's going to conclude that it's too, sorry, 2.5% two of the time he's going to conclude it's too acidic and 2.5% of the time he's going to conclude it's not acidic enough. And so even though the whole batch was normal, we're going to see about a 5% of the time, it's going to come out looking weird, but it was still from a, a normal batch. Now, Gossett was okay with that because he's saying, well, within this error, I do want to catch when the total batch is problematic. And so I'm just going to have to set a rejection region to catch when the batch was bad. He understands that 5% of the time he'll be wrong and he'll stop everything and check the batch for no reason. And he'll, oh, they'll say, oh, this is one of the 5% errors and the batch seems to be fine but he does know that he needs to have some marker of normality, otherwise he'll never know when to stop and check the original batch of hops. So when he was doing this, he would take a sample of hops and test it, and sometimes it'd come out out here as abnormal. He'd say, stop everything, let's check our batch. They'd check the batch and the whole batch was actually fine. So then he'd conclude, oh, I'm sorry, this was just one of those two and a half percent times where it ended up in the upper tail. And then they'd begin again, and he'd find another batch that was up here in the upper tail, and he'd say, stop everything, let's check the entire batch. They'd check the entire batch and it was actually fine. And so he thought, well, that's kind of strange because I really should only be uh, making this error two and a half percent up here and two and a half percent down here. But as he's progressing through the batches of hops, he's finding he's stopping 
more than 5% of the time. And he's really confused because the batches are normal, but he should only be making this error 5% of the time, but he's making it far more than 5% of the time. So as a good statistician, he went home and thought about it. And he thought, why am I making this error more than the prescriptive 5%? Because my math is correct and I'm doing everything appropriately according to how statistics is supposed to work. And then he realized there was a, a major assumption in what he was doing. When they had smaller batches of hops before the war, they were able to guess what the standard deviation is of the population of hops. But when now we have all these batches coming in from all different places, they don't know what the standard deviation is of the population of hops. Now you have to think about what would he have to have done to have gotten the standard deviation of the population? So hopefully you're thinking he would have to have sampled every single batch. That's the only way he would have known the standard deviation of the population. Well, if he samples every batch, do you see how he's cutting into the profits? Because you can't mess with every batch and then expect that you're gonna have enough to make beer out of. So he was going under the assumption that he knew what the standard deviation was of the population, but in fact, he didn't really know. And what he discovered was that assumption that he knew what the standard deviation of the population was, was lending to his problem. And he realized that the distribution that he really was presented with, that he had no idea, was actually much flatter. And so since the distribution was not as tall as the, this distribution, it went out into the tails far more. And since it's kind of like a ball of clay, you can imagine if I were to squish this, it would squish out into the tails, right? And since it was squishing out into the tails, there was a larger chunk of tail beyond this 1.96 cutoff. And there's a larger chunk of tail over here beyond this negative 1.96 cutoff. So even though he thought he was only looking at a 2.5% area, the distribution went further out. So he was actually looking at like a 30% error rate, which explains why he kept alerting that there was a problem when in fact there was no problem. He was using the wrong cutoff values. This value should have been farther over to the left and the upper end should have been farther over to the right and then he would have had a true total 5% error rate. So essentially what Gossett discovered was that this distribution that you see in front of you wasn't going to work anymore. This is the Z distribution. It wasn't going to work because it assumed that we knew the population standard deviation. And that's a silly assumption. We're not going to know that. And Gossett said, hey, I think we need to have a whole new distribution. And that distribution is going to change shape as our sample sizes sorry, our sample size changes shape. So what he discovered was, let's say he had measured almost all of the hops, not all of them, but like maybe there was a thousand and he measured 999. You see how if he'd measured almost all, then he would have had a pretty good guess of the distribution and it would look a lot like the Z distribution. But let's say out of a thousand hops, he'd only measured three of those batches. So what he discovered was, the smaller your sample size, the squishier the distribution gets. So it squishes way down and then goes way out into the tails. So the higher the sample size, the closer the distribution looks to the Z. The lower the sample size, the more it spreads out into the tails. Which means if you were using the Z distribution when you shouldn't have, you were going to be more likely to make a mistake the smaller your sample size. So Gossett made really good uh, statistical discovery with this and that this Z distribution, when you're having samples, you cannot um, act as though you know what the population standard deviation is unless you know it. And if you don't know it, you really shouldn't be using the Z distribution. So he published his paper, which is pretty cool. Now, um, Guinness didn't want him to publish his, paper, publish his paper. If you can think about why would a big company not want Gossett to publish articles about how to do statistics? And hopefully you're thinking like a businessman. Guinness didn't want their competitors to find out what Gossett was doing because 
Gossett's not the only one testing their hops. Other statisticians are testing the hops of other beers and it takes time and they stop production and they stop everything to test this and alert, oh, there's a problem. Oh wait, no, there's not a problem. And so all of that lends to um, slowing down production and quality. And so Gossett's discovery was going to change that and improve efficiency and quality. And Guinness doesn't want other beer companies to know that. So since he wasn't allowed to publish under his own name, which is a very common practice for big companies, he published under the name Student. So you can see in this tiny little um, uh, font here, he, he put his name on the paper as Student. And I think that's great because we really all are students of statistics and he just grabbed that name and he actually published several papers under that name. So essentially what the argument of the paper is, S, which stands for the standard deviation of our sample, is an erratic estimator of the standard deviation of the population, which is sigma, when the sample size is small. Let me reiterate what that means. Our sample guess at the standard deviation of the population is really not that good if we are sampling with small numbers. Now, if we've increased our sample size to thousands upon thousands, then our estimate of this population standard deviation is probably pretty darn close to the population. But as we reduce our sample size to smaller and smaller numbers, our estimate is getting worse and worse. And you can, that makes sense logically. If I'm only, if I wanna poll people on uh, how much they like to the movie, if I only ask two people, then I might not get a really good picture of what the reality is. But if I sample 300 people, I'm probably gonna get a better picture of what's happening than if I had only sampled two. So that's the bottom line behind Gossett's um, findings is that when we are just pretending to know S, uh, we were being presumptive to think that we could map it onto the Z distribution, but the Z distribution really requires that you know sigma. And if you don't know sigma, you shouldn't be using the Z distribution. So he invented the T statistic. And so we call it the student's T, right? So it's published by student and T hadn't been taken yet. So we, we call it the T statistic. And so now we have Gossett's T statistic and we use that whenever we don't know what sigma is. And what's really nice is the T statistic is calculated pretty much the same way the Z statistic is However, we compare it to a distribution of t-scores rather than a distribution of z-scores. So if you can remember, I gave you a z-table and we learned how to read that z-table. Well, Gossett made his own t-table. So you calculate the math essentially the same way, but instead of knowing sigma, we're now gonna use s in our formula. And then we look and see whether that is in the rejection region based on the t-table. So this T test has its own table of critical values. We're no longer gonna use 1.96 and 1.65 because that was for the Z distribution. The T distribution tends to have numbers that are larger than, if it's two-tailed, the numbers would be larger than 1.96. Or if it's one-tailed, the numbers would be larger than 1.65. Now, if we had measured an infinity amount of people, thousands of uh, people in our sample, the T distribution turns into the Z because it's a really good estimator of the population rate. So actually we don't really even need the Z anymore because the T will work for all cases. If you've measured the population, the T will work. But if you've measured under the population, the T will also work. But it does have its own table of critical values, so we're gonna have to make sure that we share with you how to read that new table based on Gossett's invention of the T distribution. I wanna point out that we do have different kinds of t-tests that we didn't see when we were looking at a z-test. So remember, we, for the z-test, we had an individual z and a sample z. So for the t-tests, we also have a sample t. So we're looking at one sample compared to average. But we also have two other kinds of t-tests that we're gonna be learning this semester. One of them is called an independent sample t and the other one's called a dependent sample t. So each week, we're gonna learn about a whole different t-test. So it's gonna take us three weeks to get through these, but they're all gonna be using the t-distribution with its own critical values. We're gonna follow all the same six steps that we've been doing so far 
but instead of using the Z table, we're going to now use the T table and look up the rejection regions based on the T distribution. <laughs> 